this today. So again, any questions, simply please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself right away and let me know of any questions you may have. So we're going to start first by looking at the objectives. We're going to differentiate between an inelastic and elastic collision. We'll talk about what makes one and what makes the other. Um, we'll determine the relationship between conservation of energy and the type of collision. So we're going to see a little bit of a throwback from the last chapter, conservation of energy. Uh, we're going to derive a solution that has coupling equations, meaning the equations are related to each other for conservation of momentum and energy. And then we're going to introduce what's called the ballistic pendulum, something that next year in AP, if you stay in, we'll continue the ballistic pendulum a bit more. Um, we'll do like a lab with it next year. So let's go into the first slide right away. So first, we have two types of collisions mainly. We have elastic, and then we have inelastic. Now, we'll see that the phrase inelastic is actually listed as completely inelastic, and we'll talk about what makes that up. So first, to be elastic in a collision, this is the example of mainly microscopic things. For example, from chemistry last year, you learned about gas particles moving at certain velocities. And when those gas particles move at higher velocities, it means the gas has a higher temperature. So for those problems, we're looking at examples here where we have collisions between gas molecules, and they're pretty much elastic. And what that means is that when they collide with one another, they don't lose any kinetic energy due to that collision. And that's one of the few times that we have elastic, elastic collisions. The model for this is actually, to, to use on a, on a macroscopic level, not microscopic, is uh, billiards balls, a game pool. Um, so when you hit the cue ball and it strikes another ball, say the seven ball or the eight ball, the collision that occurs there is close to being elastic. But when you play pool, every time you hit the ball and it hits another ball, you hear a sound. So the fact that you're hearing any sound at all there indicates that there must be some energy loss in the system because the sound being given off is in a form of energy. So heat, light, sound, these are all forms of energy. And those forms of energy mean that the kinetic energy must have gone into that. Um, just like you guys saw with the skate park ramp, the thermal energy was what was causing the skater to eventually stop at the bottom. This type of energy has to do with sound energy with billiards balls. Now, again, for elastic collisions, the idea for these is that they collide and then they separate. So the governing law for this is going to be that the momentum beforehand, so we have m1 v1 0 plus m2 v2 0 equals m1 v1 final plus m2 v2 final. And this was the law that we wrote last class. This was, again, just saying that the momentum initially equals the momentum at the end. Now, for elastic collision, the only way something can be elastic is if they start separately and end separately. So maybe jot that idea down. They have to start as separate objects and end as separate objects. They don't have to both be moving in both cases. For example, you hit a cue ball, and the cue ball is moving after you hit it, and then it strikes another ball, which was at rest, right? But yet we still consider that to be close to being perfectly elastic. So for elastic collisions, we're saying there's no kinetic energy loss, and the objects are going to start as two separate entities and end after the collision as two separate entities. Now, the converse, or the opposite of that, is inelastic collisions. Now, we're going to specifically talk about completely inelastic, and then we'll talk about what's the difference there. So completely inelastic collisions is when they either collide and deform and move together as one mass after the collision. So we're talking about an object that has m1 v10 plus m2 v20, and that equals the sum of them afterward times 1 overall velocity. And we did an example of this last class. If you go back and think about your notes, we talked about the example where a person jumps from, I forget where they jump from, but they land in like a cart, and then the person and the cart start moving together. So that was the example last class, and that example, whether we knew it or not, was an inelastic collision. Inelastic. And completely, completely inelastic is when they physically fuse into one object afterwards question so far on elastic and inelastic. Something to do with kinetic energy and something to do with their physical shape. That's the two things we have to remember. 
Okay, the objects literally combine as one, and it's inelastic, but if they separate after, it's elastic. And then we could also say, if the energy hasn't changed, kinetic energy of the system, it's elastic. If the kinetic energy has changed, then we're in the second case of inelastic there. So those are the two things that matter, whether they stick together or not, and whether the kinetic energy is lost or conserved or gained. That would differentiate between the two types of collisions we have here. Now, realistically, these are two ideal situations. Realistically, we actually have what's in between these. It's not really common that we have a completely elastic or inelastic collision. We usually have what we call inelastic collisions, where the objects collide or explode, and they move either independently or they move together afterward. We have something in between that, traditionally. Um, and although the kinetic energy sometimes can change, we have to remember that in these collisions, the momentum will always still be conserved. The momentum will always still be conserved. Again, assuming that there's no external force acting on this, that there's no external force. Now, that's kind of odd, right? Think about it because when two things do collide, you think about, oh, is that friction between them that's acting? So what we're doing is we're assuming that those interacting forces between the particles are considered to be called internal forces. Imagine like this particle hitting the other particle. Sure, this applies a force. This applies that same force back, and then they separate afterwards, so it's like, oh, there's an external force. But because those two particles are part of what we're calling the system, those are the two particles that make up our system, the forces between those two particles are called internal. So that's why conservation of momentum will still hold in these collisions. Um, total energy in the system is always conserved. So although we might lose kinetic energy, for example, let me write this one down. We, hold on. We might have kinetic energy of, say, object 1 before the collision plus the kinetic energy of object 2 before the collision. And the sum of those may not equal kinetic energy of object 1 after and the kinetic energy of object 2 after. So we again have to add on we called this WF, if you remember, from conservation of energy. But pretty much we have to add on some amount of work done or some amount of energy loss. I'm going to use WF again for now. It's not really the work done by friction. So I think your text, to be consistent, actually uses like a Q where they just say energy loss. And in the past I had used Q a lot for this. I called it Q loss. Um, but the key here is actually Q could be a gain or a loss. Q could be a gain or a loss, actually. So you could start with less energy in the system and end up with more kinetic energy or vice versa. Um, and those two scenarios are, are a bit different. One scenario is when two objects collide and we lose kinetic energy because they stick together. We lose kinetic energy because we stick together. So it means that we're going to have, and let me, let me scroll down a little bit so you can see this better, okay? So in one scenario, we could have it like this. Let's say the kinetic energy is 5 joules plus 3 joules. And let's say afterward, they lump together as one object, and the kinetic energy of the system is only going to be 6 joules. Okay, the combined value of those two is only 6 joules. Then we clearly see, okay, well, there was a loss in energy. We started with 8 joules. We end with 6 joules. So therefore, in this problem, that Q value must be equal to 2 joules. Okay, so we started with some energy, we ended with less energy, that's why there's a loss in energy. For this is, a again, a collision. Okay, an elastic collision. As opposed to an explosion. Okay, when there's an explosion, we have to consider the fact that there's some internal energy that's being released. And think about that. Like, how does an explosion physically work? It works because you're storing some sort of chemical, nuclear, whatever energy, energy in the bonds physically that are being broken to cause this explosion. Um, so in this problem, we would have one object as, or sorry, uh, two objects kind of as one, and then it explodes into several pieces. So this example would be like the kinetic energy in the beginning, the kinetic energy at the end, plus Q, the kinetic energy in the beginning, because it's one object, might be like, let's say, 8 joules. Okay? But then it explodes into two things. And what we're going to see, I see the chat, give me one sec. When it explodes into two things, let's say it has, you know, one of the objects has 5 joules of energy, 
and the other one has four joules of energy. Well, in this circumstance, what we're going to get for Q is we'll get that Q must be negative one. Oops. One. Q equals negative one joules there. So in this problem, what happened is we had less energy to start than we did at the end. So the system internally took some of its energy and gave it to those particles. So the grenade, let's say, the grenade, right, when it was moving had eight joules of energy and it was thrown through the air with eight joules of energy and then it exploded. And then each piece combined had a total of nine joules. Where did the one extra joule come from? This Q in this problem would be the internal energy due to the nuclear energy, the chemical energy, the breaking of those bonds between the actual molecules. So we have two different scenarios that we're going to look at where we can have an increase or a decrease in energy. Let me see Caroline's question to see if I answered it. When objects collide and one of the objects has more kinetic energy after, would that be similar to a bat hitting a baseball or something? Yeah, it would actually. Very good example. So um, a bat hitting a baseball, in the beginning, most of the energy well, I shouldn't say most, but energy is in the ball, and when the bat is being swung, energy is in the bat. And then the bat hits the ball, which gives the ball more energy and reduces the amount of energy in the bat. Okay? And they're, because of their sound, you hear the crack of the bat, you know, literally, crack of the bat, that sound, there's going to be some energy loss in that collision. So not all the kinetic energy would be conserved, yet the total energy is still conserved. The total energy being the kinetic and the sound and deformation and all that stuff. Okay, and you guys saw how that ball in the pivot lab compressed? That happens with baseball, with tennis, with basketball. When you dribble a basketball, the ball is compressing to the ground. When you hit a tennis ball, the racket is physically expanding or stretching, I should say, like a spring. The ball itself is compressing. And this happens on a very, very small or quick scale, so you can't really see it that well. Other questions right now. So we have collisions and we have explosions, those two different things. Take a one minute break and just stretch your legs real quick and then come right back. The rest of the plan for today to give you an idea is to get through examples one and two. If we can get through those two in the next 20 minutes, that'd be good. Um, and then we'll discuss other stuff for next class. So, an empty train car with a mass of 1,500 kilograms is moving east. Remember, east and west matter a lot here. The direction of our velocity really matters. Um, and collides with a loaded train car that has a mass of 2,500 kilos. And that second train car is initially at rest. The two cars are going to stick together. And our question here is to determine the velocity of the two train cars after the collision and to determine the change in kinetic energy due to the fusion and deformation of the train cars themselves. Um, before we even start the math of this, let's think about this logically. Where is, I, I see fusion and deformation, right? But we don't see two train cars physically deforming. So what deformation and fusion am I talking about? If you think about a train car at rest, and this is how a lot of train, trains work. The one car will be coming really slowly from behind. It'll, I don't want to use the word collide with, but in this sense collide. How do they move together afterward. Anybody know the mechanism involved there? What, what's going on? Or give an idea of what you think might be going on. You don't have to know about trains specifically. Just unmute yourself if you want to speak here. Yeah? What kind of a piece? Anybody have any idea? Christina's on the right idea. She's on the right track there. Like what she said, a piece of them connect together. If you've ever worked with like even model trains and stuff, there's usually something that connects the two cars. What about with regular trains? What do you think? What kind of a mechanism that we've talked about actually already that has to do with storing energy? What kind of a mechanism might they use? Yeah, there's some sort of a spring that's usually involved there. So it might be a mechanism like this, right? So here's the here's the car that's at rest. Here's the car coming from behind. And when this car hits it, it'll lift up the spring and it'll latch into this car. And then it'll move as one system. So when this back spring catches the front, it lifts it up, which is storing energy in the spring. And then as soon as it gets over the lip, the spring pops right back down and locks into place. So when you're thinking of it, think of like, um, like two open circles or two pins or two open joints and then the pin that actually holds them together. 
That's what you're physically happening there. But anyway, that's why there's going to be some sort of energy loss in this problem. Now, if they physically just collided, like a train was at rest and another one was coming in at like 30 miles an hour, you would see the train physically crumple in, right? Like the front of a car. That's why the front of cars crumple in like that. It's to absorb the energy so that it doesn't affect the driver as much. That's why the front end of a car will literally crumple. Um, okay, so let's look at the problem itself. So we want the velocity of the two train car system after the collision first. So let's start by listing. And I think I used one and two in the last, I did, yeah, I should use A and B. Remember I said not to use one and two. I think I did that in the last slide. Let's use A and B for this one. Um, so let's see what we've got. We've got an empty train car with a mass of 1,500 kilograms. So let's start with that as mass A. Um, and it's moving east with a velocity, and I'm going to say VA0, of 25 meters per second. And then let's look at the second object here. The second object is the one that's a loaded train car, and that's at rest. So that's the mass of the second object, and that's loaded, so it's a little bit heavier. And it's at rest. And our goal, in part A at least, is to determine the velocity of the cars together, meaning the system afterward. So, notice right away, why didn't I put VA or VB here for the writing in black ink on my page? Why did I not use VA or VB? What are we thinking here? What are we thinking? Why not VA or B? I see one hand so far. Isabella, what are you thinking? Very good. It's one entity. It's lumped mass, like we keep saying. Very good. So after the collision, whatever the first car's velocity is will be the same as the second car. So there's no, re no reason to differentiate here. So with that said, let's go ahead and let's take our analysis. So we have clearly a system where they're separate and they combine. So before I even continue the problem, what kind of a collision will this be based on the way we labeled our collisions earlier on in the notes? Mara, what is it? Good. It's a fusion problem. They fuse together. But which type of the two collisions, I'm asking, from the previous slide? Is it going to be Eduardo? Inelastic. Very good. And it's very misleading because the words are so similar. So inelastic. He's not saying an elastic collision. Make sure you specify or separate your words when you say it. So good. Inelastic. Inelastic. I-N. I'll write it down in case it's not clear. Inelastic collision for sure. Okay, again, because it's either a fusion or an explosion. That's going to be inelastic every time. Um, now, because they stick together, physically stick together, we could say that this is completely inelastic, okay? Because they stick together afterward. All right, so we've got mass of object A times its velocity initially. Now, object B is not moving. I'm going to keep doing this. I know I don't really need to, but just for the sake of emphasis for now. Okay, and then afterward, again, we've got the combined masses times the overall velocity. If you're comfortable by now, you do not need to write the part that's zero, okay? You don't need to start with that every time. That's fine. You could start with just what we have here. So we're solving for V final. So we have MA VAO divided by MA plus MB. And that'll give us the value of V. I think I have a number to save us some time here. I do. You can verify this or validate this, please. It looks like we've got 9.4 meters per second. Again, this is part A. Any questions on that idea? It shouldn't be any different than what we did last class, right? So this should be a review at this point. Part A is a definite review because we literally did this problem with the person jumping into the cart. It's the exact same problem. It hasn't changed at all. Notice what happened to the velocity. It went from 25 to 9.4. Logically, why is that again? So much logic makes sense in this chapter, which is nice, right? Why does that logically make sense? Isabella, go ahead.
Yeah? As soon as you have more mass, your velocity is going to go down. Again, there's no extra external force acting, so there's no way you can stay at that same velocity unless you get a little push, right? And that would be the engine thrusting forward, but we don't have that in this problem. There's no external force acting on this system here. So part B is the new part of the problem now, right? This is what makes this section different than the last section, but you're going to see a lot of repeating from the last section when you calculate your momenta. But part B says find the change in kinetic energy. So here's how we do this every time. It doesn't matter what problem we have. Whenever we want to look at change in kinetic energy, we simply look at the kinetic energy before based on how many objects are moving, the kinetic energy after based on how many objects are moving, and see how they differ. That's all we're going to do for all of these problems. So let's go ahead and take a look at this now. So for part B again, we've got kinetic energy of object A beforehand. Kinetic energy of object B beforehand. And that's a zero there. Again, object B was not moving beforehand, so it's got no energy beforehand. And then we've got kinetic energy in the entire system afterward. And then finally, we have this Q. And the Q is what we're solving for in all of these problems, okay? If Q is positive, it means, this is actually, well, maybe I should do it, let me, let me make it a little clearer here, make it easier. Because um, if we're going to get a positive answer here, if we lose energy in the system, which is kind of counterintuitive when you think about that, right? So let's do it this way. Let's start by looking at the kinetic energy initially. And let's look at the kinetic energy at the end. Okay, so the kinetic energy initially and the kinetic energy at the end. And then what we'll do is we'll say that the amount of Q is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Okay, so Q is going to equal the K minus K zero value. We'll do that afterward. We'll calculate on the left first. So what I'm doing is I'm separating it a little bit better. I'm going to say kinetic energy before, kinetic energy after, and then we'll do again final minus initial to find the delta value. And that'll be clear, and that'll actually align with our uh, signs as positive and negative. So kinetic energy initially, if we think about this, we only have energy in object A, and its velocity was 25, and its mass is 1,500. Okay, so I'm going to put it right in here. I'm going to squeeze it in here. Hold on. So the kinetic energy initially is going to be 1 half times its mass, again, which is 2,500, times its velocity squared. Oh, sorry, that's 1,500. That's 1,500 right there. Come on. There's the first mass. Times its velocity squared, and that's 25 squared. And that'll give me the kinetic energy of the system before the collision occurred, when there was only one car moving. So 1 half times 1,500 times 25 squared. It's going to be a relatively large number. We're going to get 4, 6, 8, 7, 5, 0 oh, joules. Any questions on the kinetic energy initially? Any questions on kinetic energy initially? Oh, Jack asked the question, what, what's an implosion? As opposed to an explosion, Jack, you're asking? Uh, impl so, okay. <laughs> but it, it's like a submarine collapsing on itself. Implosion. Um, kinetic energy of the system afterward okay, is going to be 1 half. Now the mass of the system after the collision is 4,000 kilograms. Where am I getting that from? It's really going to be the 1,500 from the first train car combining with the 2,500 from the second train car. And then we multiply that by 9.4 squared. So again, because this is a lumped mass, we're adding those masses together, and then we're using the kinetic energy of that lumped mass. And that number is going to be 176,720 joules. So it's obvious right away that we have more energy in the beginning, less energy at the end, so there must have been an energy loss in this problem. And this is the reason why I'm approaching Q this way. So take a look at the right side now. If I now look at this and I say Q equals final, right, 176720 minus initial 468750, 
I'm going to clearly get an answer that makes sense with the sign. That's why I'm doing it this way. I want to recognize that there's a loss in kinetic energy, and that's going to be uh, emphasized with the negative sign here. That's why I took this approach as opposed to the way I was setting it up before. Does that make sense why I'm doing it this way? Earlier you would have gotten a positive Q, and that would have been like, how does that mean it's a loss? It's kind of counterintuitive, so I'm trying to make it clear for you guys by saying, let's just think about, you know, again, the Q value in this problem as the change in kinetic energy. And final minus initial is a smaller number minus a larger number. So we're going to get negative 292, comma, 0, 3, 0 joules. Questions at all on this? I'm not seeing hands or any mics getting unmuted. Okay. All right, with that, I want to move into the second example. Again, our goal today, let's get through the first two examples today. So let's jump right into the second one now. So the second one we look at, it says, two objects collide elastically and head on. The first has a mass of 15 kilos and a velocity of 3.5 east initially, while the other has a mass of 25 kilos and an initial velocity of 4 meters per second west. Now, again, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to emphasize it again. The direction matters so much here. So we have to consider the fact that we heard east and west. Did we lose somebody? Somebody dropped out of the room. Who is it? All right, hope. Okay. All right, so she let somebody know. Good, okay. Um, and our goal here is to figure out the final velocity of the larger object if the final velocity of the smaller object is given in this problem. And we want to verify this answer by calculating the total kinetic energy before and after the collision. Why would it be important to verify it with the total kinetic energy? What, what, what should we see there? if this is an elastic collision. It says in the very beginning, right, the two objects collide elastically. So how would the kinetic energy help to validate our solution or verify our solution? What are we looking for when we get the kinetic energy before and the kinetic energy after to validate that it's elastic? How would those numbers, how would those numbers compare relative to one another? What are you thinking here? I see a hand or two. Van, go ahead. Yeah, they would have to, very good. They would have to be the same. Very good, Van. Because again, we don't lose or gain kinetic energy with elastic collisions. So that would be the same value before and after. So let's see if this is true. So we're going to start the problem again. We have MAVAO plus MBVBO equals MAVA plus MB. VB. Now, A and B are, you know, whichever ones we call A and B. So let's call this A, okay, which makes this the velocity of A initially. And then this one here is going to be B. So this is the velocity of B initially. And then what are we given at the end? It looks like we're given the velocity of A at the end end or after the collision. So this is the velocity of A again right here, 5.875. So our goal is going to be to determine this value right here, VB. Okay, it says what is the final velocity of the second object, meaning object B, and that's what we're solving for right there. So we can algebraically solve this, which I would again as always recommend. You could plug in as well at this point. It's your call. A lot of subscripts, so plugging in does help some students here because there's a lot of room for error with all the subscripts. So if you'd like to plug in, this is one of those times where I would say, hey, it's a good time to do it. But I'm going to first start by subtracting this over. Right? I'm subtracting MAVA right there over to the left-hand side, and then I'm going to divide by MB to get VB by itself. So subtract MAVA and then divide by MB. And we'll get this generic solution for VB. Um, let's see what we get as a number, as a number. You're welcome to chime in if anyone has the number. I have it written down somewhere. OK, 
Okay, there it is. 1.625. Now, let me make a point clear. If you didn't get this answer, it means you probably forgot to apply a negative sign somewhere. What is the only value that should have a negative not the only, I shouldn't say that. What are the values, really, that should have negative signs to them in this problem? Eduardo? Yeah, so when we're looking at this problem, we're noticing here that when an object is moving west, we consider that to be negative, right? So the velocity going west is VB0. We know that that's moving west with a velocity of 4, so that's going to be really a negative 4. So let's highlight this. I'm going to highlight this in yellow in the problem where I'm talking about. Okay, that's west, and then this is also west. So both of those values, when plugged into this equation, need to go in as negative numbers. So again, that's the 4, which is VB0 right here, and then the VA, which is there. So look at where I highlighted them in the equation, or this, uh, the generic solution there. The highlighted in yellow, those numbers are negative. Now, it's a double negative, right? Obviously, we're going to see a negative here. Everybody take a look, right? We see the negative right there, and then this is also going to be another negative. So we'll have a double negative, and that's fine. That'll just make this quantity positive, but it's key to make this specific value here and here both negative. Any questions right now? Any questions on the first part? All right, quickly, the second part says... Verify this answer by calculating the total kinetic energy before and after the collision. Oops. Before and after the collision. So, we need the kinetic energy initially, and we need the kinetic energy at the end. They're both moving initially, and they're both moving at the end. So, for this to be verified, what do you expect? We said earlier, as Vince said, we should get the same answer. So, what should we do with our numbers? Like 1.625 or uh, 5.875. Notice I gave three decimal spots here, which I usually don't do. Why did I do that? Why do you think I kept all those decimals? Like 1.625, right? What is that as a decimal? That's 5 eighths. 8.75, that's 7 eighths of a, fra of a value. Why didn't I round these to 5.9 and 1.6? Think about it, come on. We've talked about this throughout the year. When you round things and then you use those numbers later, what happens? Ah, there we go. Now I see the hands pop up. All right, two hands, three hands. Go ahead, Jack Turner. Yeah. For comparing the change in speeds, for sure. But like you said, the first part is the most important, rounding error. If I do this, and then I'm going to square it, right? Aren't I, aren't I going to square these numbers? The kinetic energy in the beginning is going to be 1 half, the mass of object A, times its velocity initially squared, plus 1 half, the mass of object B, times its initial velocity squared. And then we have to do the same thing at the end. 1 half MA VA squared, plus 1 half MB VB squared. Now, just to give you numbers, the numbers would be identical if you don't round. 291.875. That's what we'll get for this one, and that's what we'll get for this one as well. And again, the negative sign doesn't matter for the kinetic energy parts. Notice that? Because we're squaring our velocities. So the fact that it's moving west or east has no effect on the kinetic energies at the end here. Okay, But the concept is that those are going to be exactly the same values. All right, we're literally out of time at this point, so I apologize for that. But my key or my, my point here is this: do your homework on the beginning problems, please, for Wednesday. Get the conceptual problems underdone uh, or done underway, so that you can work on the math problems over the weekend. Okay. Again, as always, feel free to send me an email if you need a little bit of help. You want to meet for office hours or during the day when you have a free and I have a free. Okay, guys. All right. Have a good day. See you guys. So what I'm going to do here is go through a quick, I don't want to use the word proof, but a little, uh, I guess, a derivation of how we can utilize the concept of constant energy in the system.
And the key here is that we're going to look at both of the equations. We're going to look at conservation of momentum and conservation of energy at the same time and see how we can use two what are called coupled equations to come up with one general solution for it. So I'm going to start with a quick little bit of writing here. So first we want to look at conservation of momentum and start by writing that for, and we're going to write this for a two-body system. So if we start with conservation of momentum for a two-body system, we've got the mass of the object first, we'll say object A, and then the velocity of it before the collision, the mass of object B, its velocity before the collision, and then that's equal to, again, the mass of object A, its velocity after the collision, and then B, and its velocity after the collision. So this is what we've written several times now, so you should be pretty used to this. Obviously, if something did not move, then its V value is zero and that would drop off, but we're looking at a general solution where it's possible that they're both moving before and after the collision. So what we want to do here actually is rearrange this a bit. So I want to get the terms with MA on the same side and the terms of MB on the same side. So I'm going to move this guy over here to the end and I'm going to move this one over here simply by subtraction like we've done many times now. So we've got MA VA zero plus uh, minus, rather, minus MAVA, and that equals MBVB minus MBVB0. Again, just moving over those terms so that we have the masses on the same side. Then we can factor out mass on both sides. It's not the same mass, so it's not going to cancel, but at least it factors out on both sides. So MA comes out on the left side, and MB comes out on the right side. Now, this is the conservation of momentum equation again. And at this point, we're going to pause the momentum part. And let's label this equation 1. Just so later when we reference it, we can use that value or that name to make it easier for us. And underneath this, again, that was conservation of momentum. If you want to jot that down, right? Again, this is conservation of momentum. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to write out conservation of energy. And again, we can do this because on elastic collisions, the idea is that they're colliding so perfectly with so little energy loss that delta Ke is zero, or the change in energy is zero. So we could say that the energy in the system beforehand equals the energy after the collision, just like we've done with momentum. But with kinetic energy, the main difference is that we're going to have a one-half in front of all these, and V is squared. So I'm really rewriting this exact line up here, right? the one that I'm circling up here. We're pretty much rewriting that, but we're putting a one-half and we're squaring all the velocities in front of everything and squaring each. So I'm going to do it to show first, and then I'll show how things can simplify. So I'm rewriting literally the first line at the top, but I'm putting a one-half coefficient in front of everything, and I'm squaring all my velocities. Again, I'll jot this down the side. This here is conservation of energy. Right? Conservation of energy is that example. So we can use these two things together because of the collision. And what we notice now is that we've got some similarities in our equations. We'll notice right away that there's a one half for everything. So the one half can cancel because it's in front of all terms. Now, we cannot just drop off a square in all terms here because it's not squaring the same quantity or else we could then start to say to ourselves, oh, let's take the square root of everything and make this work. And we could start by taking the square root, but then we'd have square root of m everywhere. So it doesn't make sense in this process to square root and try to do that. Um, but instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do something similar to last time. We're going to move things around to get the ma's on one side, the mb's on the other side, and then factor out accordingly, just like we did a moment ago with conservation of momentum here, where we ended up factoring out the MA and the MB. So let's go ahead and move stuff again. So what am I going to move? Let's show. I'm going to move this MAVA again over to the left side. I'm going to move the MBVB0 over to the right side, just like we did earlier. But now they're squared Vs. So we still have MAVA0 squared. Then it's going to be minus MAVA squared equals 
mbvb squared minus mbvb0 squared. Just like we did earlier, let's factor out the m's. So we factor out of ma, we get va0 squared minus va squared. And over here, we factor out of mb. And we get vb squared minus vb0 squared. So these should all look the same. I mean, this last line here is pretty much the same as this line right here, except I've got these v's are all squared in here now because this was kinetic energy, whereas this was momentum. So the one half kind of drops off, and that's nice to see. So it becomes very similar in nature. Like this line is really the same as this line, except these are all just squares for all your velocities. What can we do now at this point algebraically for the next step of the proof? And it's, it's not easy. It's not obvious. Can anybody see what I can do with this last line here with conservation of energy? Can I somehow make that look simpler? If you think back, or you think to your Algebra 2 courses with factoring, I'll give a hint. What do you think, George? Yeah, that's difference of squares. That's what that is. Just like, you know, x squared minus 9 factors into x plus 3, x minus 3. That's what we have here, actually. So I'm going to write this out on the next line, what it should look like. So I also I automatically carry over my MA. Then I'm going to do that and write my two sets of parentheses, right? So this is really, again, right here. This is like x squared minus 9. This would become x right here, and then a plus 3 and a minus 3. So it really becomes VA0 plus VA and VA0 minus VA. Now on the other side with the VB stuff, notice that it's not VB0 first, it's VB first. So this one's going to look slightly different. This is VB minus VB0. So notice the switch right, in the order of your Vs on each side. That, that is important. It plays a role. Now, you're probably saying, what the heck is going on? We've got so much written here, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to label this as equation 2. Just so we can write down our next step. And what we want to do now, and it's not obvious. I want you to take a moment to look at it when I say it before I actually do it. Look at the equations, equation 1 and 2. Notice the similarities, right? Take a look at equation 1 and equation 2 and notice the similarities here. We'll see that MA is in both equations and B is in both equations. Then we've got this quantity VA0 minus VA and VB0 minus VB. That's also in both equations, right? Or VB minus VB0. So anybody have any idea how I can combine these equations? Something you probably have not done in any of your math courses. Nice, more. Go ahead. What are you thinking? Yeah, so we can definitely isolate and substitute for sure. We can do that. Um, I think that would be a bit lengthy of a process. So I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Mora that we can do that, but it would take probably three or four steps. So is there another way we can do it a bit shorter? Is my question, I guess, or a bit quicker. Anybody for a quicker? Is that Jack? Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, very good, Jack. So what Jack's doing inherently, actually, is he's kind of like dividing the equations. So what he recognized, and I'll circle it. I'll use some yellow up here at the top so you can see it. Take a look. This quantity, right, in yellow that I've underlined, is the same value as this quantity in green. And I'm going to underline them over here, right? It's this part here and this part here. And then I'm going to underline them over here. And it's this part here. Oops, wrong, wrong uh, underliner. This part here, MB. And then this part right here, right? So if I look at those, those underlinings at the bottom equation, since what's underlined in yellow is equal to what's underlined in green, it's on both sides of the equation, right? So those things technically are the same value. So they would indeed cancel out. And that's what Jack is getting at. If you want to, it might be nice to think of it as dividing equation 2 
by equation one. Think about that for a second, let it sink in. Look at the two long equations here. If you take the whole equation two and divide the entire equation by equation one, it kind of, you can see it canceling a bit better. And if it helps you to write it out, just literally write it out, take the left-hand side of equation two and divide it by the left-hand side of equation one. Take the right-hand side of equation two and divide that by the right-hand side of equation one. So inherently, we're taking equation two and dividing it by equation one. And as a result, what will happen is exactly what Jack said. What you see underlined in yellow and in green will just drop off, right? Those will just cancel out because you're dividing the same quantities. So what you'll be left with as a result of all this will be VA0 plus VA equals VB plus VB0. And again, where is that coming from? I'll highlight that so you can see it. That's pretty much what's left over here and here what's highlighted in red. That's what's left over when you divide equation two divided by equation one. And what is that really telling us, right? How is this useful to us right here? Well, here's why it's useful. What we can do is we can utilize this relationship as our second equation for all elastic problems instead of using conservation of energy. Conservation of energy gets really messy because a lot of things are squared, right? Think about that. Your velocity terms are squared. So if you're looking for an unknown velocity, you're going to end up with a lot of quadratics if you solve by using conservation of momentum and conservation of energy for these problems. So instead of using conservation of energy for elastic problems, we can still use conservation of momentum, which is our first equation, right, at the very top up here I'm pointing to. Okay, that's the first equation, which was conservation of momentum. We can use that because that's easy to work with. It's all linear. But I don't want to use this every time. I don't want to use the conservation of energy part because it gets really messy. So what we're going to do is we're going to utilize the first equation at the very top and then this very bottom equation down here. Okay, And this is a special case, so write yourself a note that this is only true for elastic collisions. Okay, again, make sure that you're writing a note here that this is for elastic only. This is not true for inelastic because inelastic, the assumption is that there is some delta E, some change in energy in those equations. Let's get into an example so you can see a bit more using a bit more of usefulness of this. Okay, and we're going to show the proof in this in the in the next example. So let's say example number three here. Any questions on that idea? I know it was a lot of writing for that. Do you see why, or I'm hoping you see at least why it's easier to use this bottom equation now instead of using conservation of energy, because energy involves square and V, and it just gets messier when you're solving for V later on. Okay. And feel free to have this equation written down like as a separate equation on the side. You know what I mean? So you can have that on the side of your notes, and I keep telling you guys like have like you know a running equation sheet of stuff that we don't have on our normal equation sheet. This is one of those things to add. So example three is a relatively simple one. I was actually going to demo this one for you guys. Um, I'm staying at my parents' place, and they have a pool table, and I was going to show them the pool table. But right now it's covered by a ping pong table. Uh, we've built our own ping pong table and just put it on top, and it's pretty heavy stuff. Uh, and it was, it was a bit of a headache this morning to start moving, so I was thinking about it, but I, I, I went against it. But if you have a pool table at home, this is a great example for it. And, uh, and billiards in general is a great example of elastic collisions, almost perfectly elastic. Uh, the rolling nature of the ball does change it a bit. So example three says a billiard ball traveling north at a speed of three meters per second collides with another identical one that's at rest. The ball that was moving stops immediately after the collision. And notice it's an elastic collision. That statement being made helps a lot. Um, that allows us to use that extra equation that we just derived. After the collision, what is the speed of the billiard ball that was initially at rest? Right? That's the first question. Or right, that's the only question here. So let's write down what we know. So we know that the first one, let's say MA, is the same as the second one, which is MB. So we'll just call them both M. And remember, whenever the two objects have the same mass, we want to start by saying, let's just call them both M to make it easier. We're told that the first billiard ball is moving north with a velocity of 3 meters per second. When I hear north, I think up or positive in the y direction. So I write that down right away. And that's, sorry, that's V. Oops, that's a... It should be a VA0. 
Okay, and that's the velocity of the first object A. The second object is at rest, so we know VB0 is going to be 0 meters per second. We're told that the ball that was moving, right, the first one, then stops immediately after the collision. So the velocity of ball A after the collision is 0. And our question is, what is the velocity of ball B after the collision? Now, based on what you know from the context of the problem, what you've seen already, you could probably answer this question, right? We've done this problem already. Where have we done this problem? Where have we seen this problem? What is it identical to in model, but not in number? What is it identical to in model here? What are we thinking? Think back maybe to earlier on in this chapter. You know, two objects colliding. Identical masses. The key there, identical masses. One is moving before the collision. One picks up some speed after the collision. What do you got, Regina? I see your hand. Go ahead. It's like the train car, but in the train car, what's the difference? Yeah, they stick together in the train car problem, right? So for the train car problem, we're really looking at an inelastic collision. Here, the billiards balls or the pool balls are going to hit, right? And then the one is going to move afterward. Other suggestions? Christina, what do you think? Yeah, it'd be the soccer ball in this problem. Very good. The reasoning behind this, you think of the soccer ball, was the soccer balls were identical in mass and it was an elastic collision, right, where they collided and separated afterward. So this can be modeled identically to the soccer ball problem that we looked at. And in that soccer ball problem, what did we recognize? What was our conclusion that we made at the end of the problem? It was very important. We said something. We made a statement, a verbal statement at the end of the problem. Moral, what was it? Very good. So think about that. What Mara said: a gain in velocity of the first object of the second object is a loss in velocity of the first object, or vice versa, right? But the loss of one becomes the gain of the other when the masses are the same and when it's elastic. So we have the same problem really as what we had earlier with the soccer balls. So if I want to know how much velocity the second object's going to gain, what's that number going to be? How much did the first one lose? Seb? Can, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Exactly. So I can go through the math and I can use the inelastic, uh, the elastic equation of conservation of momentum and do all this work, but I could just recognize that my answer is definitely going to be 3 in this problem. Again, the first pool ball was moving with this velocity, right? It was traveling up until it hit the other one, and then it stopped. So it lost 3 meters per second. So the other one must have gained 3 meters per second. Had the other one been in a starting velocity of 1, it would jump up to 4. If this had been at 2, it would jump up to 5. All right? So we just see that it's a gain that matters here. So this is the gain in the end, and that's our answer. Now, why am I pointing this out, and how does this, how does this validate what we just derived in the previous equation? Right. So let's quickly or mentally go back and jot this down. So I'm going to jot down our derivation on the previous one. And what we wrote down on the previous slide at the very bottom was this. Our final statement was that VAO plus VA was equal to VB plus VBO. That was our statement we wrote down. And we said this is true for elastic collisions always. And now try it. Make sense of it. This is 3 plus 0 equals blank plus 0. Well, solve for VB in this problem. Solve for the question mark. The answer is definitely 3. So that derivation that we just wrote down could have also given us this answer very quickly. Again, this answer is what we were looking for in the problem, and it's clearly must be 3 for it to be 3 equals 3. So that statement that we jotted down on the last slide, again, very important and can be jumped to right away. Okay, and that's true when you have, again, a elastic collision occurring. Elastic. Questions at all? Okay. 
All right, let's look at another example here. So this example we're going to see, oh, let's, let's get into it first before I give too much away. A pellet is fired with a velocity, it's mass m, with a velocity of 24 meters per second into a resting clay cart. So imagine like, you know, uh, Play-Doh, okay, Play-Doh, and you take a really small pellet or a BB and you fire it and it embeds itself into the Play-Doh, causing the Play-Doh to then move, right? Um, and the Play-Doh or the resting clay cart has 11 times the mass of the pellet, 11 times. Now from this information, we want to determine the following. The velocity of the pellet cart combination after the collision and in terms of m, the amount of energy needed for the pellet to embed itself into the cart. So what kind of a collision do we have? Let's start with that question. What kind of a collision is occurring in this problem? What do you got, Jack Turner? It's a fusion problem. Very good. This is a fusion problem here. Nice. So Seb, what would be the scientific classification for this type of collision? What would you use? What phrase? You had your hand up, that's why. It is a fusion problem, Jack's right, but what type of collision would we call this? What do we label it as? Very good. This would be an inelastic collision, okay, because the two things are fusing together. So we could actually call it that other word, right, completely inelastic or perfectly inelastic, where they physically fuse to become one afterward. But it really doesn't matter at this point. We've seen that it's either elastic or inelastic that matters. Because it's inelastic, what does that validate? It tells us, well, there's going to be energy loss in this problem right off the bat. So part B will have an answer to it. Right? Part B says the amount of energy needed for the pellet to physically embed itself into the cart. So that's got to be some amount of energy needed to do that. Because think about it physically, right? If you want to take Play-Doh and you want to stretch it, what do you have to do? You have to physically apply a force of some sort, right? You have to actually use your own energy to deform it, to bend it, to make it, you know, to, to flex it, to change its, its X in a sense. It's almost like a spring. You're compressing or stretching it, storing, gaining energy. So there must be energy. So let's see how Part B is going to work here with inelastic. Um, but to start, let's start with Part A, obviously. So first, we know that we have, the, we have a pellet, right? And we could say the mass of the pellet is equal to m. And then the mass of the cart is equal to 11 times that. Why am I doing this? Why am I starting with m and 11m instead of using ma and mb throughout the whole problem? What do you think, Mora? Yeah. If I have an m in general anywhere, it'll cancel. The coefficient will be left behind, right? Like if I cancel all the m's, I'll still have an 11 left behind there. But if I have m in every term, it can cancel. Whereas if I leave everything as ma and mb, I'm not going to be able to cancel until the very end when I substitute in. So it makes more sense to start by writing these as relative masses, one of them being m and the other being 11 times that. Okay, so to do this, let's go ahead and write what's happening. So first, how many objects are moving before the collision occurs? How many objects are moving before the collision occurs, Caroline? Yeah, just one. And in this case, it's the pellet, right? The pellet's been fired. So we could say the mass of the pellet times its initial velocity plus, well, the card is not moving before the collision, so zero. And then after the collision, how many objects do we now have? How many objects do we really now have after the collision? Well, how do we think of it, at least, I should say, right? How do we think of this system as what? Christina? Very good, Christina. So again, it's the sum of the masses afterward. Good, good phrase there. A lumped mass or a combined mass or a system mass, if you want to call it that. So yeah, after the collision, that's what's happening. So if you're having trouble visualizing this, right, I'll put a little diagram at the top. Here's how you can think of it. You've got your pellet, right, being fired into a wooden block. And this is the before. And then afterward, you literally have the pellet inside the block, and this object is moving to the right. Earlier, this one was moving to the right. Okay, so that's before, and I'll put after if it helps at the top there. 
So this is the equation that describes that motion right there, right? MV a zero equals m plus 11m, that quantity, times the final velocity. Why don't I specify a subscript on the v on the right-hand side there? Why am I not putting va or vb or anything on the right-hand side? What's going on in this problem that's allowing me to just call that v? Valentina, what do you got? Correct. There's only one final velocity because it's really like one object or one entity afterward. So we don't have to specify. So our question here is really determine the velocity of the pellet-cart combination after the collision. So we're looking for that little v. We know that the velocity of the pellet to start was 24 meters per second. That was another given that we had in the problem. So let's solve this equation for little v. We, on the left side, we've got mva0 equals 12mv. Like we said earlier, mass is going to cancel. Now keep in mind that that 12 doesn't drop off, right? That 12 is a coefficient on the right-hand side right now. And I got the 12 from doing m plus 11m yielding 12m. So once the m's cancel, now I can divide by 12. And that's what the velocity of the combination will be. So the combination of the pellet and the cart together will be moving at the same velocity that the pellet was moving at, divided by 12. Divided by 12. So the pellet was moving at 24 meters per second. Divide that by 12 will yield 2 meters per second. That'll be the velocity of the pellet-cart combination. Why is this answer logical? Why is this answer logical? Why does it make sense? We've done a couple of these now. We've talked about this afterward. What are you thinking, Christina? Go ahead. Yeah, very good. Just like we talked about with, uh, if you recall, the hockey puck and the hockey stick, it ended up being like one-eighth of that velocity because there's eight times more massive. Well, now we're going from something that's, you know, a certain mass to becoming, in this case, 12 times more massive. So as a result, the velocity is 12 times less, right? 12 times less or one-twelfth of the initial velocity it started with. Now, how about part B? So that was part A. That was part A. I'm going to slide this over on the screen because we don't really need it at this point. But part B, it says for us to figure out the amount of energy needed for the pellet to embed itself into the cart. And it says in terms of M, right? In terms of M. So if it needs this in terms of M, it means our answer is going to have what in it? What's going to be in our answer if this says, come on, you guys are all doing SAT prep. I know that. When a problem says, in terms of, what does that mean? Yeah, more. Yeah, it just means M's in the answer, guys, right? So it means you know you're going to have an M in this answer. You can't have just a number by itself. So we want the energy needed. Well, remember, where does the energy come from? The energy that we lose in the collision is what's being used up. So we're trying to find the energy that's used up for the pellet to stick into the cart, which is really like the change in energy in the system here. So let's find the kinetic energy before the collision. Let's find the kinetic energy after the collision. Let's see how much they differ by. Right? And once we know that, we can know how much energy was utilized to physically embed it into the cart itself. So the energy beforehand is going to be 1 half the mass of object A, which was the pellet, times its velocity squared, which was 24 squared. That's the whole kinetic energy in the system beforehand, right? There's nothing else moving. The cart was not moving before the collision. So that's all we've got for the energy in the system before, which will give us, what, 24 squared divided by 2 times m in this problem. So we'll have a value here of, what, 288? And that's, sorry, it's k0 right there. 288 m. And again, m is not a unit, right? Keep that in mind. m is not meters at all. If you want to put joules on the end, make it easier for yourself. Put joules there. 
So you remind yourself that that's your unit. M is the number or the mass of the pellet. Then if we want to find the kinetic energy after the collision, we still have one half. Now the mass after the collision is m plus 11m, and then times the velocity squared, which was 2. And the velocity of the system after the collision was just 2. So this will become k equals 1 half times, what do we have, a 12m times a 4 right here. So this will just be 24m units of joules. So we clearly see that these values are different, and that, that validates our answer. We should be getting different kinetic energies because the problem involved embedding. And any time a problem involves two objects becoming one and embedding it, we know that we're going to have some sort of energy loss due to that. Whether it's the two trains coming together and the, you know, the little the hook combining the two trains, linking them together, causing energy loss, or in this case, something physically burrowing itself into another object. So what's my change in energy? It would be final minus initial. So my delta K in this value is going to be negative 264M. And those units are joules. So in the problem, we don't know what the number is, right? We're not given an answer with numbers. But if we knew that the pellet was, say, two grams, we can plug in 0 0.002, right, in kilograms into that problem and see how much delta K we would get in joules. But this is in terms of the mass of the pellet, and that's how much energy would be needed. It's negative because we're seeing final minus initial. So if you want to think about energy as a positive quantity, meaning the energy needed, just ask yourself, you know, what are we really finding here? You could say what we're really finding is like the absolute value, right? We're finding the overall magnitude of the amount of energy. And then you can think of this as a positive if you'd like to. But again, the problem is just asking the idea of how do you find out that energy change by looking at final minus initial. This would have been zero if this would have been an elastic collision where they hit, separate, but it's not. Right? They hit and they stick together, which is why this answer is not zero for the kinetic energy change here. Um, all right. Questions on examples three or four. We have one more thing to get through for today. I want to ask if there's questions on these first, because the next example is going to kind of come from example four a bit. So I'm going to ask that beforehand. Anything at all about this? Okay, so let's keep in mind from this example two things. One, conservation of momentum is, have, is valid here, like we showed, but conservation of energy is not valid, right? Conservation of energy was not valid because we didn't conserve energy. We used energy. And let's keep that in mind for this next example. So to finish up for today, we're going to take a look at what's the most, one of the most classic examples in all of momentum is called the ballistic pendulum. And this device was actually used for the longest time. And it was used to measure the velocity of a projectile. And this obviously happened before radar guns were around, before other techniques were around, before pivot labs, right, where you can see things in super slow motion and measure the time and using a ruler, literally measure the distance like you guys have been doing. So before all of this technology we have now is around, before radar guns were used, this was how muzzle velocity was determined. And the phrase was called muzzle velocity because it was the velocity of a, a bullet, really, exiting a rifle or a barrel of a rifle. Um, and the way it was done was as following. It's just seen in the picture here. The bullet was fired. It hit a block, traditionally a block of wood, something it could embed itself into. That block of wood would then rise up to a certain height on a pendulum-like system, the way it's set up, and the height that it rose up to would allow us to determine the muzzle velocity. And you might be asking yourself, like, how is that possible? How are we going to do it? Well, we're going to show mechanically how it's possible with a little bit of equations here. So what we want to do is we want to break this up into two parts. Okay? I want you to first think about the momentum piece, where the bullet has velocity, it has velocity, it has velocity, it hits the cart or the block, and then the block is about to start swinging with some velocity itself. Forget going up to a height. So let's only look at, for now, this part here and this part right here. Imagine it has not swung up to a given height yet. We'll get into that part as the second part of this problem. When it swings up to a height, we're changing height, which means we're changing energy, right? We're going from having maybe its motion of kinetic energy into a height 
which gives it potential energy. So the second part of the problem will look at energy. But the first part, I want to look at what we've circled in blue here. And what I want to do is I want to start by writing out our laws of conservation of momentum. So we've got the bullet fired, mass A, times VA0. That's the velocity of the bullet as it's traveling before it hits the cart. Now, the actual cart or block in this case, that's not moving to start. So we know that there's no overall momentum for that in the beginning. So this is really all we've got. Now, once they've collided, it's just like the last problem. We've got the mass of the bullet itself, MA. We've got the mass of the block of wood, MB. And that's moving at its own velocity, V. So this is the beginning of this problem, which is pretty much the same as the one that we did in the last problem, just with different masses now. And this is just the idea of conservation of momentum. Now, unfortunately, we can't go any further with this. How come we can't go further is because we don't know a couple things here. We don't know VA0 and we don't know V. We could assume that maybe we're given the masses in the problem, and that's something you can measure on a scale, so that would be easy to measure. But you would need to know both of these variables for this problem to go, and we don't know both of them right now. So we need a second equation to use, and the second equation that we're going to utilize today is going to be conservation of energy. But we have to go back and think about now this part of the problem that I'm circling in yellow. And what's circled in yellow here, we're going to have kinetic energy, um, and then we're going to have potential energy as it rises up. So let's write down our conservation of energy equation. Energy at state 1 equals energy at state 2. I'm not losing any energy in what's circled in yellow because it's just about rising up. It's not about the bullet embedding itself. The bullet's already been embedded, and it's already moving at the bottom with some velocity. And then it's just moving upward. So there's no energy loss, there's no work done by the bullet embedding itself for this part of the problem. I'm then going to write the types of energy I have. When it's at the bottom, I'll use red here, it's all kinetic energy because it's about to start moving. And that's kinetic energy in the first instant. And then when it gets up to the top, it's going to stop moving. So that's potential energy at the second instant. So this becomes kinetic in the beginning and potential once it gets up to max height. And again, it's only potential at max height because it stops at max height. There's no velocity there. And after this, we can just start plugging in equations that we know. We know kinetic energy 1 half, and this is going to be the mass of the system times the velocity after the collision squared. Okay, again, notice I didn't put VA0 there. That's just V because we're talking about the velocity right here. This velocity is the velocity at that moment when it's just starting to move at the bottom of the swing. And that's this. And again, this is the kinetic energy it has at the very bottom. Then the potential energy it has when it reaches the top up here is always going to be represented by mgy. So let's see, we've got m, g, and then how do we designate y in this problem? Well, in the diagram it's given as h. If I look back at the diagram here, Let's pause and help ourselves by writing the following. Ready? We can write this as ground level. So how far is this object going? Well, it's going from there up to there. And that's a distance of h given in the diagram. So the change in height here, or the height of the object when it's at max height, is called h in our diagram. All right, so at this point in time, what we want to do is we want to somehow be able to figure out the muzzle velocity, which is this right here, VA0, in terms of simply the height it moves up to. So I need to get this H somehow into this equation. I don't want to care about the velocity of the block and the card as it's moving at the bottom. I want to somehow eliminate that variable. So can somebody see what I should do in this problem now? If you need to, you want to call this equation 1, and maybe call this equation 2. Can we combine equations 1 and 2 somehow? Can we combine equations 1 and 2? I see one hand so far. Two hands, okay. How can we combine equations 1 and 2? Come on, try to think outside the box. something going on here. George, go ahead. Give us a little help, George.
So MA plus MV could be a substitution, but actually, George, before you even get to that, these cancel because they're on both sides. So it actually simplifies that equation two at the bottom there a bit, right? So before that, I didn't simplify it, so it, I guess that was a bit misleading. You would maybe say, like, substitute those in, right? But those happen to cancel, so let's maybe even write equation two in simpler form. There's equation two in simpler form. Let's call this equation two then, because it is a bit simpler. So I kind of misled you there, George, sorry. So let's imagine now this is equation two then, yeah? How would I then combine equations one and two based on this setup? What's the one variable that links the two equations together? That's what you have to ask yourself, right? Just like when we did this, what is your linking variable? Is Justin, in this case, what is it? Absolutely, it's the V value there. So let's solve for V in the second equation and plug it into the first one. So this will become V equals radical 2GH. That's what this equation will solve for V when we solve it. And then we can take this expression right here for V and plug that in back up there for V. So again, I put a little squiggly line here to separate what we're doing here. In that beginning part, this was, again, conservation of momentum. And down here, this was conservation of energy. The momentum was conserved when the collision occurred. Energy was not conserved, was not conserved when the collision occurred. Energy was conserved when the mass rose up from a bottom height to its max height. That's when energy was conserved, when the mass swung up into the air, which we're thinking of as like the second part of the problem. Again, important as to why we have to truncate problems in physics and break them into pieces to see them separately. So if we plug that V, that radical 2GH, into the first equation at the top there, let's take a look what we get as a result. We'll get the following. MA VA0 equals... MA plus MB times the quantity radical 2GH. And then our final solution for muzzle velocity, remember that was the goal of this problem, was to find the velocity of the projectile that's being fired. And that's just VA0 over here. So we just have to divide through now. And that would be my final solution for this problem. Notice the MA doesn't cancel, right? The MA does not cancel here because of the fact that you have MA plus MB. Yeah, sure, you could distribute the square root to both terms and then try and cancel, but it's no point in doing it. It doesn't help you at all. So this was the unique way to figure out the velocity of a projectile when it was fired. And look at the problem. Look at the answer, rather. What is the answer in terms of three things? Well, four things, I guess, assuming we're on Earth always, then three. The height, right? Go ahead, Mario. Yeah, go ahead. What are the three things? All things that you can do what? Easily measure. Easily measure. How do you measure the mass of something? All you need is a triple beam balance. Those existed for the longest time. So both of those masses could easily be measured. And the height change? Psh, all you need is a ruler, right? All you need is a ruler to figure that out. Now, we're going to talk a little bit further about how we can also use the angle and it's not obvious in the diagram, but the angle that the pendulum swings up to. See how there's like an angle it swings to? We could figure out this angle here and see how we could use that angle instead of H. Okay, it would be the third variable, the angle instead of H. But we're not going to focus on that right now. This was just a lengthy enough problem already. So this is the ballistic pendulum problem, okay? Um, that's kind of what I wanted to go through today. And you guys already did page 190 and 191 for homework. That was last week. So 193 is the new problems, and those are all math-based problems for elastic and inelastic collisions. Okay, make sure you know which problem you're working on, which whether it's inelastic or elastic, before you even start the problem. That's the most important thing you're going to see in this section, and then work your way through the rest of the problem. Um, you can go if you have no questions, but if anyone has questions on the Pivot Lab or anything that's been going on in class lately that wants to clarify anything, feel free to hang out and, and just ask those questions now. I do have office hours today instead of tomorrow. I, thought, I hope you guys noticed that online. Okay? Today instead of tomorrow, you know, June.
All right, so feel free to go if you have no questions, but hang out if you have a couple questions. You're welcome. You're welcome, guys. Sure. You got it, chat.